Hello, welcome to the Sunday Science Q&A. We are here every week, pretty much. Uh, I am joined, uh, as usual, by Helen Chersky, who we'll see very shortly, and she's going to tell us about uh, This Week in Science, uh, which is basically what happened is we did a show and tell for nearly a year. Um, Helen doesn't live in a huge mansion. She ran out of things that were in her cupboards to show and tell. So that's why now she's also, and it's been fascinating anyway, uh, telling us about what's happened this week in, in, in science, a historical piece. We also have, uh, amongst that, we have have the author of a, a, a book which uh, I would highly recommend you you go and buy because it's a, a, a novel um, which uh, suits these times. Uh, though I am I'm actually reading a, a kind of pandemic novel at the moment moment uh called uh, nod which is always about uh, basically about a, a plague which means no one ever goes to sleep again and i have made a terrible mistake reading that because it feels like it's a kind of shamanic piece of literature which is now affecting my insomnia um but we are going to talk very shortly to jenny roan who uh, wrote a novel called cat zero uh and uh, look up cat zero because it has a, a it, in fact just buy it because it, it definitely um it has a level of prophecy to it. it came out in 2018 still available go and have a look at that um and we're also going to be uh uh, joined by Andrew Steele. I'll just tell you a few quick things. First of all, um, if it's possible, if you uh, don't support us for our patron already and you are able to, um, this would be a, a magnificent thing, as you probably realise, for uh, Trent, our producer, and Josie, who I do a lot of shows with, and myself. We basically have no paid work anymore. I mean, I do have some paid work doing Monkey Cage, but whenever I've told people how much I earn, they always go, oh, I thought it would be more, and so did I. But anyway, uh, so we're not able to tour, which is the main way that we uh, normally do all of our work. Uh, and we have slightly less than 2% of the people who watch our shows uh, and listen to our shows who support us for our Patreon. If we can gather up to 5%, if there's 5% of people who enjoy the shows we do, uh, who are able to support us for our Patreon on a monthly basis, this will make an enormous difference to us. We've got loads of stuff coming up. Uh, on Tuesday, I'm going to be doing uh, a kind of talk show thing, whatever, about sleep dreams and the mind i'm doing uh, every two weeks i'm doing a, a new show looking at different ways that we kind of perceive uh reality uh, both in a broad sense and sometimes our own personal uh receiving of different ideas of reality so i'm going to be doing that and i also have a guest on that carla mckinnon who's very interesting an artist who uh, made a, a brilliant 20 minute film all about sleep paralysis which uh, i highly recommend you go and look up carla mckinnon as well so we're doing that on tuesday we've got a new uncanny hour next week which is all going to be about uh uf why we believe in UFOs, uh, the kind of look at uh, the religion UFO crossover uh, and various things such as that with uh, people like Dallas Campbell. And uh, we're going to be doing loads more. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to, I'm not sure which ones of these, but for some of our Patreon supporters, um, you will be able to see uh, hopefully the conversations I'm doing next week with Andrean and also with Brian Green, which are part of another new uh, series for Patreon, which is probably going to be called Tips for Existence, which is basically looking uh, for, from scientists and artists and, and a broad group people including Tim Minchin and Neil Gaiman and Nicole Stott and Francesca Stavrokopoulou um, talking about the way that uh, they find meaning in what may well appear to be uh, a meaningless universe so look at meaning and uh, purpose from scientific and both and also artistic perspective um, and uh, a couple of new things science shambles or uh, tomorrow I'll just see what else Trent's put up for me uh, tell everyone to keep an eye on Twitter right keep an eye on Twitter that's what Trent's told me there uh, we've got a couple of events coming up soon which we think will uh, interest you uh, a great deal. Well, most of you a great deal, some of you slightly less, but it should be a great deal because they're interesting events. And if you've got any questions that you would like to ask, uh, then you can either go to our live chat uh, or you can tweet at Cosmic Shambles. Uh, and uh, then we, so we, we've got a huge number of questions sent in already. But if you have a question while you're watching this, you suddenly think, I want to know this, uh, then uh, we are able to deal with that. So today's guest, I've already mentioned uh, her novel, Cat Zero, uh, Dr. Jenny Roan, who is Principal Research Fellow at UCL. Good morning, UCL. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good evening, actually, wherever, good evening you are. actually, wherever you are, uh, because sometimes it used to be wherever you were geographically would tell you about what time it was a day, but I think now at this point in lockdown, sometimes you might be in the UK and it might officially be afternoon, but that's not where your mind's at. Where's your mind at, Jenny? My mind's a late, gloomy afternoon and I'm really cross that we didn't get any snow. Oh, we got snow. Yeah, it's, it's doing all right here. I have a, yeah, I, I, I do apologise. Exeter were very cross as well, apparently. They briefly had it and then it melted. <laughs> now you've got, I hope, a show and tell for us. I do. Would you like me to unveil yes, it now? I would. Well, it, it all starts with a hydroponics. So I got into, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an avid gardener and I got into hydroponics a couple of years ago with these little, you know, little desktop thing. And then that wasn't enough. And it's like a gateway. So now I have a massive marijuana grade LED array hanging in my spare room 
I hasten to add, I'm not growing marijuana. I'm growing vegetables. And I'm just really excited because <laughs> this is my first produce. It's a cucumber. Isn't it beautiful? That's fantastic. Gorgeous. So I've grown this indoors and it was it's all going really well until the aphids came. And now aphids are absolute bastards. I don't know if you know anything about aphids, but they, they absolutely drive me nuts. They get everywhere. They're all sticky and disgusting. And that's when I decided that I needed one of these. So this is catnip. So catnip is this amazing plant that's apparently full of chemicals that not only cats find, uh, it was just something in nature recently uh, mentioning that catnip is, you know, basically like heroin for cats. And they, they were studying jaguars and lynxes and domestic cats and tempting them with catnip and seeing how they, and studying them. I get, they got a grant for this. I can't believe it. Anyway, so instead of being a cat lady, I'm a catnip lady. I have 12 catnip plants all over the house. I'm trying to keep the aphids away, but unfortunately it doesn't really work in that the aphids love the catnip. <laughs> They're supposed to be repelled by it, but actually it's everywhere. So do, you have I, a, do you have a cat, Jenny? <laughs> no, but the funny thing is when they, when they act like a decoy, they, so all the aphids are attracted to the catnip and then I put it outside for 24 hours and all the aphids die and then I bring it back in again. So it's like a sink or a decoy. But the funny thing is it's the, the neighborhood cats, whenever I put these things out, they go absolutely mental and I can't go out the next morning and there's cat vomit and it's like they've been having a, a crack party. So yeah, I'm a catnip lady. Uh, the first step is admitting you have a problem. And that's my show and tell. <laughs> well, that's great. You, and it, sorry, what, Helen. What do your neighbours think when their cats come home um, on a, like, <laughs> afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> They've been out in a bender. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's legal. It's legal to have catnip, right? It's not like a class A drug. So <laughs> I feel, you know, they kill our birds, so they deserve it. Oh, here we go. There we go. There's the, 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 the tree of life, the cycle of life and uh, and, uh, and and death very, very early on. Uh, and uh, that's it. That's it. I, I, it's lovely to see that the, the, the cucumber you've grown as well, because I do think for anyone, as, as we don't know how long this lockdown is going to continue. And I realize that some people have a very limited amount of space. And I would say if anyone can find any way if they don't have access to a garden of, of working out a system where they can grow something or nurture something, it really is uh you know, the, the the research has much research has been done to this, and it's a very very useful thing uh, in times when sometimes we can feel quite precarious. Um, we're joined by Dr. Andrew Steele as well, who has uh, a new book out called uh, Ageless. Uh, so I presume that's part of your show and tell, Andrew. I hope anyway. <laughs> Do you know why it completely isn't? I decided, computational that... scientist, I would eschew all physical things. So my show and tell is actually a photograph. <laughs> Um, in fact, it's a series of photographs. It's my favourite photograph that I've taken in the last year. Let's see if I can make it appear. Otherwise, you're not going to see anything. There we go. This is a photograph of a rainbow. Now, I think everyone's probably seen this. But what really excited me about this is that I've been trying literally for years to get a rainbow that's bright enough and that I happen to capture it with enough time to get it not just in the visible light, but also in the ultraviolet and the infrared. So that means that, you know, we can see the seven, seven, eight, you know, define it however you like, colours of the rainbow on the visual picture. But what you can see is that if we go to the next shot, you can see it in the ultraviolet. There's actually a UV rainbow on the inside of the main rainbow, sort of, sort of beyond the blue end. And then if we go back to the visible one again, what you can see is that on the other side, outside the red, there's an infrared rainbow. And you can also see all the weird properties of infrared light on this picture. The trees are glowing really brightly. So if I just throw these things all together, you can see that we've actually got a rainbow that extends far beyond the visible spectrum that humans are able to comprehend. And so this, um, you know, having been <laughs> locked down in our houses for the last year, I think this is probably the most exciting thing that's happened to me. <laughs> it is It is an interesting thing with a rainbow, isn't it? Because, rainbow, the joy isn't never it? Go because the joy never goes away. One of my last trips uh, was to Dartmouth and looking over uh, on the ferry, uh, the town opposite, which name I've forgotten, which I apologise for, but um, th there was a whole rainbow. You could literally see it as if it came on both sides up from the ground. Normally there is a little bit where it kind of fades out. It was the most solid rainbow I've ever seen. And the delight in that day, I also once saw a, uh, a double rainbow while watching the band Eels at uh, the end of the road festival. And uh, eventually Mark Everett told us to stop looking at the double rainbow and start looking at the band again, um, which was a delight. Um, that is, one of my other, can, I, can I tell you one of my other favourite rainbows that I've seen? What, what isn't known, what isn't very widely known is that rainbows actually aren't just half circles, they're full circles. So the, the way that it's, I, it's basically every position that's a certain angle away from the point opposite the sun in the sky. And so most of the time, for most people on the ground, the sun's above the horizon. So the point opposite the sun is below the horizon. And you see sort of an arc is the rainbow. 
But if you're up in a plane or if you're up on the top of a mountain, you can actually see that a rainbow sometimes is a full circle. And so I saw one of those uh, from a plane window a while ago, and that was absolutely, as you say, the, the joy just never, it's such a simple thing, but the joy just never goes away. Well, it never stops being never weird. stops being weird. How can white light contain all those colours? It doesn't make any sense at all. Science. No, it really, really doesn't. And well, I also thought this show, this show and tell thing is already. I, I mean, I'm sure you joked many times. A terrible. Podcast. If anyone's listening to this through their ears, you can go to andrewsteel.co.uk/slash/rainbow and see the uh, see these pictures. Most so people can be join the joy. This, so don't worry. It is predominantly oh, cool. visual. This one, but uh, that was good as well because so there, there will be go. some people listening. Oh, Helen, on, you've got you something go. to add there about the uh, the shamanism of white light. Oh, I was just saying, you know, you just expressing, you know, we physicists try all these years. We've talked to you, Robin. We've told you things. We've showed you evidence. And you still don't believe us even about a rainbow and white light. And that was back in 1600 and something, 1700. No, no, I do believe you. I'm just saying this universe, universe is a very absurd place, which is fortunate, which is if it wasn't absurd, it would have no space for living things because they are, as we know, predominantly absurd. Um, as we all know, it started normal with physics and then it kind of chemistry came along. And then from that point onwards, it's just been chaos. Um, now, I'm going to start off. Uh, Helen, I'm going to come to you about halfway through. I think we're, we're about, about 3.30. We'll do if that's OK, your, your uh, historical week in science, because I want to get to this question because it's something I know, like most questions I ask on this show i know nothing about almost anything um this is from dave hodgkinson i'm going to start with you um andrew others might want to join in dave uh with an exclamation mark at the end of this says explain telomeres please or telomeres <laughs> yeah when you tell someone that you're writing a book on aging get as often does that have something to do with telomeres and the answer is maybe um so there, there are bits on the end of your dna you have your dna inside your cells is split up into 46 what are called chromosomes you get 23 from your mum 23 from your dad and on the end of each of those chromosomes there's a basically a stretch of repeated nonsense dna and the reason is it's trying to solve a rather stupid problem of evolutions when evolution tries to copy your dna the enzymes that do that can't actually make it all the way to the end of the string of dna and evolution enterprising though it is rather than fixing that ridiculous problem decided well what we're going to do is just stick some nonsense on the end of your chromosomes and that means that if a bit of it gets lopped off every time a cell divides, it's not so much of a problem. At least it's not eating into any of the sort of valuable genetic information that your DNA is mainly storing. But obviously this comes with a problem. And that problem is that as your cells divide throughout your life, your telomeres get shorter and shorter. And so what we've noticed is that people who have shorter telomeres than other people who are the same age, they're more likely to die sooner. They're more likely to get age related diseases. So clearly there's something going on. However, there's, uh, there's a paradox, as there always is, between ageing and cancer. And the, so the, when you think about a cancer, what cancer is, is a cell that can divide an infinite number of times, effectively. It can divide and divide and divide and become a tumour and spread around your body. And obviously, that's how it ultimately goes on to kill you. So if you just give mice telomerase, which is the enzyme that can extend their telomeres, you're effectively pre-ticking a box on cancer's list, as cancer's got to find some way to keep its telomeres long as those cells keep dividing. So yeah, if you just give mice telomerase straight up, then it just gives them terrible cancer. They don't live any longer. They just die of cancer rather than dying of other things. However, what's really exciting is that in the last few years, we have started to do some experiments where you give mice telomerase that's only turned on uh, temporarily, or you give them telomerase in addition to some other anti-cancer genes. And these things do seem to make the mice live healthier, make them live longer, and not predispose them to cancer. So that's one of the many different ways that we could think about tackling the aging process with science. Um, Jenny, would you like to add anything to that? No, no, I just think evolution is blind and stupid, and it is like a one of these Heath Robinson devices. It, things get cobbled on, and if they work, they're fine. Yeah, we weren't supposed to live longer than about 40 years old. I'm a woman. I should have died after having my kid because um, I wasn't necessary anymore. So I guess all a lot of these adaptations that are plaguing us and aging are, are because we weren't supposed to live that long in the first place. I know Andrew's trying to change all that, and I'm looking forward to hearing more, but but it is it, it's just you know we want to reproduce and then we're done i, no, I think we're the most sorry oh, i think one of the most fascinating <laughs> Oh, we're not doing very well, are we? I was going to say, one of the most fascinating things with respect, with respect to the organisms that Jenny studies is that bacteria have circular chromosomes, and that means they don't have ends, and that means they don't need telomeres. And yet, for some reason, I think we don't really fully understand, at some point in the evolution of life, life went, actually, circles are rubbish. What I want is straight lines. And that's what introduced this problem. So as she says, you know, evolution is just, it's just so stupid. It's got no foresight. When it straightened out those chromosomes, it, you know, wrote its own, it basically, you know, wrote all of our own funerals. 
Helen. My question very briefly was about bats because I met bat a bat once. once specifically because someone was studying its telomeres because bats have, you know, there's this thing that larger animals live longer. In general, there's this kind of relationship that small things like mice, you know, a year or two at most, elephants go on for a long time. And um, bats are this weird thing in that they sit way outside that line. And someone was studying bats' telomeres. But this was maybe eight years ago. And I don't know if they'd come to any conclusions. So I just wondered if either of you knew anything about the telomeres of bats. Because one of the things they were looking at is, well, since bats live so much longer than other mammals of the same size, maybe they've got super, super consistent telomeres that don't get shorter or something. It's very interesting. Know? So the other the other thing that can happen with telomeres, I've obviously given a simplified answer. The other thing that can happen with telomeres, as well as getting shorter, is that they can suffer what's called oxidative damage or other kinds of DNA damage. And um, but actually, this isn't going to answer the question very effectively because we know that bats um, they live longer. And what, so one of the things that was thought to drive aging and is now much more contentious is the idea that things like oxygen and sugar, these very reactive molecules inside can damage other molecules they can damage your dna they can damage the proteins and maybe that sort of accumulation of damage is one of the things that drives the aging process and while there are probably is still a grain of truth to that a really fascinating thing about bats is they seem to live a very long time but they don't do it by preventing this damage or repairing it they just live with it they've got this incredibly fast metabolism they, they can fly so obviously that requires a huge amount of energy and so they're constantly getting damaged to their dna damaged to their telomeres and yet they still just seem to keep going. So there's a lot of head scratching going on. You know, why, why it is that bats can live so long and also why they can harbor diseases. Because I think there's, there's thought to be some relationship between this sort of robustness and the fact that they can harbor diseases, like perhaps the coronavirus that's currently plaguing us all now might have started in a bat because they can basically live with these things. But then when they jump into an organism like a human, they cause chaos. But I'm also bats, you know, some bats, for instance, sleep for 19 hours a day. That might come into it as well, to it as well. I Do you don't know. What? know. That, was, I, I, that, that, that was that was actually speculated. Jumped to the position of about 1980s uh, evolution, evolutionary biology of aging. But in the 90s, there was a discovery that actually there are a lot of tropical bats that don't um, have these you know incredibly long sleeps. They don't hibernate, which were all thought to be reasons that you know maybe they were aging at the same rate. They just had these lovely long sleeps that sort of slowed their metabolism down for extended periods of time. And actually, even the tropical bats that don't hibernate, don't sleep particularly long, they live ages as well. So it's not just sleeping. You can't uh, sleep your way to immortality. <laughs> Now, um, Je Jenny, um, Je Jenny, well, actually, I want to just pick up on something you said. When, when you talk about, you know, that we should all die at 40, I think it was Kurt Vonnegut, who is, his dentist said to him, you see how long these teeth are actually meant to last. That says how long you're meant to last. But it was an interesting thing you said after having children, because I know, I think I first came across it in probably Jared Diamond's book, uh, Why Sex is Fun, where talking uh, about the menopause for instance that and seeing an evolutionary advantage that was because I, I i'm not entirely sure how many species as far as i know it's very few that have a, a, a menopause um and and i'm kind of intrigued as to your thoughts on you know the idea that there is an advantage to have uh, a group of people in your tribe in your group who are no longer bringing up children who will perhaps be able to care for some of the children when the younger women and the the younger men uh, go out on hunts or, or collecting things. I just wonder, yeah, any thoughts on that? Altruism and group selection, it's very contentious. I just want to point out that Jared Diamond, if he was a woman and had menopause, he wouldn't think it was an advantage because it, it is really, uh, speaking personally, it's, it's just kicking my bum. But uh, that aside, I think, yeah, a lot of people think that the elders of the tribe would have looked after kids. And of course, you're related, you, you are genetically related to those people. So I was being a bit flip when I said I'm not really necessary after the age of 40, but I, I mean, it, it isn't necessary, is it, to have grandkids, uh, grandchildren being looked after by grandkids? It's yeah, it's really fascinating. Like, you could, how it's optional. Rare, it's fascinating how rare it is, I think. I, I think there might be a third species, but humans have menopause. Killer uh, whales. whales have menopause. Elephants. elephants have menopause as well. And yeah. I think that's that's basically it, which is just incredible. You know, Given the diversity of mammals, the diversity of animals, it's crazy that there's, you know, there's, there's this handful of species that seem to have somehow worked out that that's an evolutionary advantage or not, as Jenny may think. But they're social species, right? Because it's not just about physically child walking into the fire. It's about wisdom, like not where, where are the vegetables? What do we do when it rains like this? Where do we find the watering holes when the other watering holes dried up? It's, you know, so I, I'm sure you yeah, can... Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. All of those, there's a collective... I was, I read, I, there was an astonishing... I was listening to a podcast about, it might have been about Afghanistan, um, and someone said the average, the median age in Afghanistan is something like 22 or something, like horrifyingly young. 
and yet they clearly are people there who are much much older so a lot of them you know don't last that long but just the idea that that might have been more representative of a society that you do have some who somehow survive all the disease and the trauma and they last long enough and they know what happened last time a pandemic came along um and everyone else is just kind of dealing with it as best they can you know you can see how valuable that would be but obviously you've got to test that in proper scientific ways and i'm not that kind of scientist no if it was a fruit that you could balance in a bowl as oh, regular viewers would oh. regular viewers would know <laughs> but once we move to uh, we could go on now and talk about the nomadic tribes and all those different issues but jenny i'm going to move uh on to uh, this question from lorraine and uh she'd like to know why does covid and other viruses like it affect the old in the population more what does being old have to do with not being as good at fighting infection unfortunately past about the age of 30 or 35 it's basically downhill for everybody the immune system starts to tank you know, we have a thymus that shrinks. That's the thing that gives us all our T cells. The, the, the diversity of our T cells becomes much less. And even, so it's quite cool, even our, the cells that are supposed to respond to infection, instead of going in a straight line to the infection, they meander around, you know, they stop for coffee, they forget where they're going. It's, it's really interesting what happens to cells when they start to uh, senesce and, and become old. They just don't function very well. And it, it's a mixed blessing because, you know, you don't want to have you don't want to have your immune system is waning so you might say well at least you're not going to get autoimmune diseases maybe there's some blessing there but there seems to be no silver lining it's just bad news all around uh, there's a lot of interesting things with covid we don't understand there seems to be an overactive immune response which is causing the problem which is odd because older people don't have really strong immune reactions so there's something something there that we're not really sure about i think uh, it's you know it's shifting every day but the most recent thing I read about this was that older people tend to have, are less likely to have that early warning system, the innate immune response that happens straight away. So it's like the burglar alarm has been deactivated. But I think there's still a lot we don't know about it. Thank you. I'm going to have now a question, going to have now a question from uh, Phoebe's daughter, Paige. Paige is seven. Hello, Paige. I hope you're watching now. Um, and uh, she would like to know, are scientists studying immortal jellyfish and figuring out how to let people live forever? Now, I really want to show, throw that one to you, Helen, because I imagine of all the panel, you probably met more jellyfish than the rest of us. I've met quite a few. Um, I'm not an expert on the biology, but they're interesting because they're colonies. They're not, it's not a single animal. And so it's I guess it's a really interesting because I mean, we have this assumption that life has to be like us. Right. It has to have kind of arms and legs and have bilateral symmetry or whatever, occasionally circular symmetry, you know, and 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 one of us is what an animal looks like. But jellyfish are interesting because they are they're just colonies that, that they're a collective that they, they don't have. I don't even know if they've got the same DNA across the jellyfish. I, I'm not entirely sure how this works, to be honest. I would have to look it up. But I think one of the one of the things that makes the aging a jellyfish very hard is that, you know, if one of our cells dies, it gets replaced by, you know, a cell sort of, you know, a new cell that was made from another cell that is definitely part of me. So the new one is part of me because the one it was made from is part of me. That's kind of how it works. Whereas in jellyfish, I don't know how true that is. <laughs> I'm not very good on jellyfish biology, but they are very There's weird. There is a fascinating, so the immortal jellyfish she's talking about has a um, has this really, really bizarre property, which is that it grows up and it becomes old. But then at some point, and it's not entirely clear why, it decides it's sort of old and clapped out enough that it effectively reverses its whole biology. And it sort of does a Benjamin Button and ages backwards and turns back into a polyp, which is the youthful form of a jellyfish. And then after a period of time, it can then remature back into a full adult. It's called the Medusa phase, delightful name. Um, and, and just you know, live its life out as an adult again. And then whenever it wants to, it can reverse back and go forward and reverse back. And just it seems to be able to do this an indefinite number of times. And what's really bizarre is these, these jellyfish have actually spread around the world thanks to shipping because they can hide out in things like ballast tanks inside ships. And then when they open the ballast tank in a port because they're taking the... Um, you know, or they, yeah, because they're taking all the cargo off, then the jellyfish can you know, swoop out into the waters and colonize that port and move to a whole new part of the world. So these things have spread all around the world. And what is, I think, even more fascinating and even more useful for humans is that actually this same process of reversing the biological clock inside cells that jellyfish use, we seem to be able to use on human cells and mouse cells. And we've tried inserting a number of genes. Um, these are genes called the Yamanaka factors, which were first discovered because they can turn back the clock in cells to turn them into pluripotent stem cells, which are cells that, cells that can become any other kind of cell. And if you put those same genes into an adult mouse and activate them in quite a careful way, you can turn back the biological clock in those adult mouse cells as well. So that's just, again, another way that we've got that we seem to be able to slow or reverse the aging process in animals. Uh, also, you showed there you were an F. Scott Fitzgerald 
Fitzgerald fan. He used the reference of Benjamin Button. Robin Williams fans, of course, could have used uh, the uh, backward aging of Mork uh, from Mork as well. Um, <laughs> this is a question from Marvin. This is specifically for you, Jenny, which is uh, Marvin's interest in knowing that as, as a lab scientist, you probably haven't been able to go to the lab very much. How has your research been going? How do you deal with doing research during times of a pandemic? It's been, it's re been really hard for everybody all over the world. I think everyone I know had at least last year had gone into at least four or five months of complete lab closures. And in that case, my research team, some of them were, were okay because I do a lot of computational work. They had lots of data that they'd squirreled away and they started to analyze it and write papers. But my, my new students, my PhD students, PhD students, I didn't have any data to analyze. So they, they were you know, sort of making lots of plans and, and, and thinking about what they wanted to do in the future, but couldn't actually do anything. At the moment, the labs are open. So university workers, at least in the UK, have been, have been called key workers. So everybody's going into the lab and working except me. I'm superfluous. I don't actually do lab work. I just write grants and papers. So I can do that at home. I feel a little bit guilty that my team are out there at the front line you know, battling public transport, going in just because they really, really want to do their research. And it's optional, but they, they all want to be there. And I'm really proud of them. And I'm a little bit scared for them. Uh, so I think, yeah, scientists really have a passion for their work and, and they're not going to let a virus stand in the way of getting their lab work done. Thank you, Jenny. Um, this is from uh, Jay. This is definitely for you, Helen, because uh, I think so, only because this is bubbles. Um, it's snowing here this morning, and this this uh, started a discussion between my partner and I. If the outside air temperature dropped sufficiently quickly enough, could a water bubble freeze so that you had a snow bubble or ice bubble like an Easter egg? Would the temperature need to drop too rapidly for this to be possible, or would the weight of the ice snow collapse any possible bubble? So That's I think the snow is a bit a separate question to the bubbles. So you can freeze soap bubbles. Um, you can blow soap bubbles in minus 15 and, and you get this, at some point there's a nucleation point, you know, some little speck lands on them and you can see it's like frost spreads around the bubble and you can freeze a soap bubble. So so it, it's a very delicate process because obviously water um, expands when it freezes. And so you need the right kind of thin bubble. And it, it you know, I don't, I think it's quite hard to catch on film, you know, because they don't all nicely freeze. You know, the whole thing doesn't freeze. Um, in when it comes to snow, so snow is already a crystal, um, and actually rain often starts off as ice and then becomes water again, and then sometimes refreezes. So, so snow and bubbles are a bit. They're very separate things, but you can definitely freeze soap bubbles um, if you've got a nice thick bubble outer layer. Uh, but you, not in Britain, sadly. It's one of those things. It's like seeing perfect snowflakes. We, the reason for anyone who is and Jenny, don't feel too bad because it was it was snowing a little bit here this morning in South London, and then it's rained raining now. It's all gone away. Um, so one of the things about the, in this country is we don't see proper snowflakes. You know, if you, if you ask a kid to draw a snowflake, they will draw a six sided snowflake with perfect symmetry. You do not get those in the UK. Almost no one in the UK has ever seen one. Because what happens in the UK is that it's uh, it's a bit too, well, quite a lot too warm, actually. And um, those are very fragile. So what happens is they're falling is that they kind of break apart and then stick into each other. So the snowflakes we see are kind of lots of, they're a pile of broken bits. And for it to see the perfect hexagonal snowflakes, you need, it needs to be at least minus 12, super dry. And that does happen in other places, but it doesn't happen here. And it's always been this interesting thing to me that if you ask any British person to draw a snowflake, they will draw something they have literally never seen. Um, but yeah, so it's just a bit too warm and wet here to yeah. get fun snowflakes or to freeze soap bubbles or to um, see the Mapemba effect by throwing coffee in the air and turning it into snow. So I'm afraid you have to go to northern Canada <laughs> if you're into all of that. Can I just say, it's actually genuinely really, really good, good fun. fun. Um, it's happened to me once in the UK. My parents live in one of the coldest places in England. I think they've actually, their local weather station in the 1980s has had the record of the coldest ever English, not Scottish, obviously the Highlands are another thing, the coldest ever English temperature. And there was one year, sometime around Christmas, when it was about minus 15 or minus 20 even at night. And I spent the whole afternoon blowing bubbles and running around the garden with my camera trying to catch them on film. And as <laughs> Helen says, it is incredibly challenging, but incredibly good fun. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, uh, Jenny, question for you from Mark. Uh, Mark says, I know viruses and bacteria are different, but my question is, why don't we see antiviral resistance in the same way we have antibiotic resistance? Or do we? We do see resistance. So if you think of, for example, human immunodeficiency to virus, the virus that causes AIDS, 
it has lots of um, drug resistance, and this is why we have to give combination therapy to patients because HIV will rapidly evolve resistance to just one drug. Uh, if you look at vaccines, uh, if you look at influenza virus, uh, every year we have to get a new jab because influenza virus mutates to be resistant to the vaccine. And there are all sorts of other uh, sort of examples of viruses that are very variable and have lots of mutation that can get around not only our defenses, but, but drugs. The truth is we don't have that many antiviral drugs. There's only a few that exist. They're so hard to make. Thank you. That's um, Helen, I'll tell you what, uh, we're uh, going to come back to uh, the audience's questions uh, shortly. And remember, you can send in your questions, either uh, pop them in the live chat or tweet them to at Cosmic Shambles. Um, but Helen, so what happened this week in science? It turns out that there are very few big papers published in January because scientists don't work over Christmas. <laughs> I've been looking what? through for various things. And I found all kinds of interesting things that were published in March and September and November. But there, there was, was one piece of science that was done in January. Actually, the breakthrough was on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. And the reason it's interesting is because it is completely tied up with the politics of the time. And this is the work of Lisa Meitner and the discovery of the understanding, really, of nuclear fission. And this was back in 1938, 39. So, the, the neutron had been discovered. They discovered that you could send neutrons at other types of atom and, and they broke apart into bits, but no one was really sure what the bits were and what was going on. And um, Lisa Meitner was a theoretical sort of chemist physicist working on all of this in Germany. And throughout the course of 1938, because the you know Hitler came to power, um, she was as an Austrian citizen, as an ex-Jew, she was chucked out. Basically, she she went she she basically went as a refugee to Sweden with nothing in late 1938, and and she never stopped work. Like she never had a university a proper university position ever again. But that winter. She was talking, to, you know, they were all done by phone calls and there was, she was talking to her nephew on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day and they were sitting outside on a log and they sat down, they wrote out the basic equations and what she worked out, her, she made many contributions, but the big contribution was she worked out that you have this big nucleus that's uranium, you break it into two bits, but then there's some stuff left over. Where does the stuff go? And she was the one that worked out that E equals MC squared says that you can, you know, matter and, ever, and energy are equivalent. And she worked out that there wasn't enough mass in what was left over, but what there, what you got was energy that could push those apart. And she then fed that back. And very, very quickly in January, um, one paper was submitted and then another one with some extra experimental work was submitted. And so, so, and throughout all of this, she didn't really have a home. She was living out of two suitcases. She had this position in Sweden. Sweden weren't that fussed about her because she wasn't Swedish. And I have to find my notes on this. So as a, and as a result of this, Otto Hahn, who was one of her collaborators, and was got the Nobel Prize, which she said was fair. But she was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics 29 times and for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 19 times. And she was never given it. And um, so, so that, and of course, then you know, as soon, and this is 1939, right? Nuclear fission is discovered. 1945, the Trinity test comes along, the first test of a nuclear weapon. So this very short period between this brilliant discovery that was made, and she would have nothing to do with weapons. She walked away from all from any application like that. But that discovery was what made nuclear weapons possible. And it was others that realized you could have a chain reaction, that this reaction also spit out, spat out neutrons, which could, could then kick on other atoms and, you know, you, you get this cascade. And so it's just this astonishing story of th through a war, someone who has been as senior as you could be as a woman, as a woman at that time, she's only the second person to get a, a PhD in physics, only the second woman to get a PhD in physics. And she kept working and she wasn't acknowledged for it. And then this discovery was at the heart of... Uh, the nuclear weapon war, really. And then, of course, you know, we, there were plenty of peaceful uses of nuclear physics after that. And so, and that all happened basically over December, January, February. And, the, you know, the, the paper was submitted to Nature in January. And so that's that's what happens when you let people, when scientists do their work over Christmas, but you've got to give her credit for just work, you know, persisting with her work in a, in a phenomenally hostile environment. 38. 38. No nominations for a Nobel Prize. Yeah, never got it. But that ca there can't be anyone else. Sorry, Jenny. I was just wondering, you think if she was interested in what? the Manhattan Project, you think she would have gotten the Nobel? Do you think? So she I looked, so one of the things that happened is that the, the Nobel Prize
he has a a bit like the 30 year rule for British government documents. You know, after, after I think it's 50 years, they release all the papers. That, so that's why we know how many nominations she got, because they don't say that at the time. But, you know, 50 years later, they start making those public. And there's a recent book written about her that I haven't read, but I've read an article by the author. And so she went back through all of those papers and she thinks the reason she didn't get it was a, a bit of a mixture. It was partly that she was cross-disciplinary, like the physics people didn't understand chemistry and the chemistry people does understand physics. There was some political sensitivity because... Um, she, you know, and she was given help. She might well not have escaped. She certainly had friends and relatives who didn't escape Nazi Germany. Um, and so there were some political sensitivities. And there were a couple of other things that were sort of just, it was all a bit weird. You know, so so I think sexism is probably partly in there at the bottom of all of it. But there were a lot of other things that were to do with society and how it worked. But the, the the sad thing is that she was never really given a proper position after, you know, she, she she was sort of on the edges a little bit and she wasn't a lab experimentalist, so she didn't need a lab, but she, she collaborated, you know, by telephone and by doing her work. But, um, and she did get lots of prizes in other ways, but she never got the Nobel Prize. Thank you, Helen. We'll have another one uh, of those next next week and uh which just reminds me that i just mentioned uh uh some of my book shambles that were, one that went up this week which i highly recommend a, a pioneer in perhaps a different area of uh, of the world in electronic music but in many other things as well Cosi fanny tutti uh, uh josie long and i uh spoke to her and uh if you've not read her book art sex music it is a fantastic book and it has so many different things to recommend it in terms of uh about art in terms of integrity in terms of creativity in terms of what it was like being uh, a woman in the counterculture uh, and and to some extent uh, still is with whatever's left of the counterculture uh cosy fanny tutti that was it was an absolute joy um to uh, talk to her so book shambles is up now and also the one from the week before with alan davis um i highly recommend and i also highly recommend uh his book as well just ignore him uh so uh when well uh, i don't even know what, right this, I think, is going to be could be the end of the show, really. This is from Dickie. I'm just going to ask this and get each person's in, uh, in individual reaction. Jenny, I'm going to start with you. Dickie would like to know, can one be genetically predisposed to certain behaviours and emotional mental states? Now, when you first hear a question like that, what is your reaction? Yes. Uh, and I don't, I'm not an expert in any of this, but my feeling is that many things, most things can be affected by genetics just as most things can be affected by nurture. So I would be surprised if there was, wasn't anything that wasn't affected at, at, at some level by genetics, and, and that would be no exception. But I'm, I'm not an expert in the field. It's a complicated question though, isn't it? Like there's a, there's a, there's a big, um, it, it can be used as a politically loaded question. <laughs> And that's the danger, that there is a difference between talking about the sort of small differences that scientists talk about, you know, what colour your eyes are and what colour your hair is, and then the things that people extrapolate that to. So UCL, University College London, my university, and Jenny's as well, has just, um, you know, published a statement on it, on its historical connections to eugenics and uh, Francis Galton. They've renamed a couple of lecture theatres, you know, and they've been very upfront about, you know, this is... These were people who worked here. We do not endorse in any way what they did. Um, but we have to acknowledge that they did this and they did it here. But we we do not celebrate their work. You know, so so I think that's the difficult, probably that's what you're alluding to with the question, Robin, is it the problem with that is scientists go, oh, scientific question. Let's answer the scientific question. And that's not how everyone else sees it. And it is also, uh, I also, sorry, sorry Andrew, I was going to say that. I was going to say, I'm going to, I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm going to answer this question in a way that relates to the one bit of uh, heritability genetic stuff that I've really been digging down into for my book, which is the heritability of longevity, so how long you live. And I think it's very tempting to imagine that this is, you know, it's potentially quite a heritable trait. You know, it might, it's, it's to do with the robustness of your cells and your molecules. It's to do with, you know, your organs. It's to do with all these different things that you'd think would be at least to some extent determined biologically. And um, a lot of this stuff is determined by twin studies. So you look at how long pairs of identical twins live and how long pairs of non-identical twins live. And you try and use clever maths to tease out, you know, how much of it is determined by genetics. But what you find is that when you do make all of the corrections that you're supposed to make, um, it's probably less than 25% of your longevity is determined by your genetics. And actually the most recent study, which was a little bit controversial, said it was less than 10% of how long you live is determined by, um, by what your, you know, your parents' ages, basically. 
So even something that's a sort of narrowly biological almost as how long it is you're going to live, how you're going to age, how susceptible you are to different diseases. When you actually you know, get down and really do the statistics rigorously, a lot of these you know, seemingly large effects can start to evaporate. So you can imagine with things that are a little bit harder to put your finger on, things like behaviours, things like personality traits. I think you know, if you do the study really, really carefully and properly and correct for all the hugely complicated statistical biases you have when fishing around in six billion letters of DNA in order to try and find single traits, then I think a lot of these effects are going to be small or difficult to pin down or dependent on other factors like the environment that you're in um i'm not sure my connection went down for a a little bit and i'm not sure i was i was going to say uh that i would recommend and other people might but robert plowman's book i found very interesting in in terms of about um heritability and uh, but as as i think helen was saying that was where my signal was going a little bit weird also there is a problem where quite often when these things are put in the press they become utter definites and as we know we have had education secretaries who had advisors who said oh hang on well your intelligence is genetic so we can perhaps just start swabbing people's cheeks and then just stream them that way and there there lies madness um and we don't know if that, that madness comes from nature or nurture but sometimes in education <laughs> advisors they do seem to have it almost inherently within them <laughs> um this is uh right helen quick question from i can't quite see their name on this this is helen you tweeted an article this week about covid causing problems uh with replacing weather monitoring boys and sensors what is the likelihood and then consequences of all these remote sensors uh dying before we can get to them so yeah so it's a bit of background for everyone else here there are there are and there's enormous does is it starts from here's what the world is doing now and it kind of runs the physics forward inside a computer but in order for that to work you need that here's where we are now thing and so all over the world there are um a huge range of weather measurements there are radio sons balloons that are sent up at airports there are um you know, weather stations like the ones you hear about in the shipping forecast, there's all kinds of monitoring stations. And the problem with COVID is that um, a lot of these things, for example, the Argo floats, what happens is there's 4,000 out in the ocean, about 60 every year, you know, their batteries die or they get knocked over or bashed by something. So if you don't put 60 more in, you have a, the number is slowly going down. And a lot of very remote weather weather stations um are you know they need someone to go out and service them and obviously in lockdowns you know people can't get out to service them and the problem is that by definition the most valuable data stations are the weather stations are the ones that are furthest away from any other weather stations you know when i was on that uh, expedition to the north pole a couple of years ago we put up a radio sound four times a day that was literally the only atmospheric transect like anywhere within sort of 500 miles of where we were so it che- we literally were changing our own weather forecasts so the question so what's starting to happen is that you know we're sort of all right at the moment but scientists are noticing that these things are kind of keeling over we can't send the ships out to replace them because ports are locked down so it's not an immediate problem today um it sounds as though all it will do is kind of degrade things a little bit most people won't notice the big measurements um won't be noticed and people are trying to fix this but it's just like eroding away at the edges and sounds a bit like telomeres yeah basically (laughs) uh and we haven't you know nothing is refreshing them and so yeah so i don't think anyone should panic about the weather forecast immediately becoming worse there are plenty of other threats to that like um starlink and uh, you know all of that kind of stuff um but but it's just it's just eating away we're just used to weather forecasts getting better and better and better and you know, the next few years, not just with COVID, with other things, it's going to put a bit of a halt to that because getting data is really hard. So I don't think anyone should worry, but it is just we can't take it for granted. We can't take data for granted. Um, Jenny, we've had a question from uh, Angelo. Uh, Angelo would like to know, when we age, what actually ages? ages? I thought cells were constantly replenishing. I think this is a better, better answered by Andrew. And well, oh, okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All, all kinds of things are happening when we age. So the, the cells are constantly replenishing. And actually, one of the things that causes us to age is what we've already mentioned, the telomeres, because as those cells replenish, they have to divide. When they divide, they have to copy their DNA. And that means the telomeres start getting shorter. But there are actually a whole load of other things. In the book, I break it down to 10 what are called hallmarks of the aging process. And these are the various different sort of cellular, molecular, biological, fundamental underpinnings of why it is we grow old. And that can be everything from the cells themselves aging, from the telomeres getting shorter shorter can be damaged to your dna damage to the other molecules inside your cells damage to the things outside of the cells and i think the one that's um that's sort of easiest to get your head around is actually is the aging of the cells themselves and there's some very exciting work being done showing how we can remove these aged cells 
and they're called senescent cells. And one of the reasons a cell can go senescent is because its telomeres get too short. And so what happens is the cell goes, oh, my telomeres are really short, or oh, my DNA has been a bit damaged. There are a variety of different ways it can happen. And the cell says, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop dividing because I'm, 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 you know, I'm in danger. I could become cancer. So I'm just going to sit here, not divide, try and keep things nice and safe. But unfortunately, as we get older, because there are more reasons that our cells can become senescent, and because as Jenny was talking about earlier, our immune systems get less effective at clearing them up, these cells tend to accumulate. And what we found is that they basically accelerate the aging process. So that might sound like quite depressing news. But the exciting part is that scientists have found drugs that can kill these senescent cells while leaving the rest of the cells of the body intact. And if you give them to older mice, and so mice that are about 24 months old, it's about 70 in human years, then they live a little bit longer. But they don't just live longer in sort of geriatric ill health. They actually extend their healthy life as well. So they get less cancer, they get fewer cataracts. Uh, they can run further and faster on a little tiny mousy treadmill, which they have in, uh, in rodent labs, I understand. And they even have better fur. So it's really the sort of global reversal of the aging process by getting rid of this one underlying cause. So there are, as I say, we think about 10 of these at the moment. I'm not going to say that's a definitive list and we might not find one or two more in the next few years. And also these things are interconnected. So it's a variety of different processes. Some of it's in the cells, some of it's not in the cells. All, all these things sort of cumulatively are what make us age. Thank you. Thank um, you. Um, question from Christopher. Uh, Jenny, are genes themselves immortal as in the sequences themselves? Wow, what a question. It really depends on how you... I'm thinking of bacteria, which is what I work on. And, you know, one bacterium divides into two. And, and essentially, a bacteria are immortal in that, you know, there's no beginning or end to the organism. It is just a, a constant division. And those genes, if they're useful, will carry on. If they're not useful, eventually they can be ditched by evolution. They can change. Are genes immortal? I mean, you could argue that we are related, all of us are related to the very first thing that turned into a cell so many billions of years ago. So yeah, in some way, shape or form, I guess genes are immortal. Well, there's a very famous book, wasn't there? The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which is these HeLa cells that are used precisely because she had, a, uh, I think it was ovarian cancer, and they were, this particular type of cell kept dividing. I've and got them in my lab today. Yeah, they're still going. <laughs> I and mean, people use them all over the world. But they're not the same cells that, that you know, they've, they've changed considerably. They're mutating. They're evolving. But, yeah, in theory, if you kept them going and somebody, somebody looked after them and, and fed them and removed their waste and, and kept them going in a new dish for the next infinity years, it, it, it would be immortal. But it I wouldn't be the same really thing. It wouldn't be the yeah, same. Yeah, it's like, it's like what's, what's really important is you've got to try and keep those conditions exactly identical. Because when those cells first arose in Henrietta Lacks, they were evolved, as it were, for, be, you know, for growing inside her, you know, her uterus or her ovaries or wherever it was the cancer started. But then when you take them into a lab, then and we've been growing these things what, over half a century, like 70 years or something like that, that means that they're, they're actually evolving for the lab environment. So if you put them onto a new uh, substrate, you, know, you feed them a different food, basically, then presumably they'll evolve. The genes that are better at digesting that food will be selected for. And because they're a cancer, they're naturally very very, you know, very prone to mutating. So yeah, you'd have to try and maintain their environment exactly consistent in order to keep those genes going in exactly the same form indefinitely. Um, Andrew, I'm going to throw a question. This is uh, just a, this, uh, just a, a, a arrived on a live chat. Zap fan wants to know, uh, what is the present status on calorie restrictions and aging? And your answer will affect how much of the gluten-free fruit cake I have at five past four. Oh, man, it's so complicated. And this was the most frustrating part of the book to research and write because so the, the idea is, let's, let's rewind back to the 1930s when the first experiment was done that showed that ageing is, is more malleable than we might once have thought. There were some rats and they were split into two groups or actually three groups that were fed different diets. And the rats that were fed as much as they wanted, they, um, they, you know, they lived a certain amount of time. But the rats who had their rations substantially cut back, and I'm not talking about going on a diet, I'm talking about eating 40% less every day all of the time. It was, it was observed that these rats would live much, much longer. They actually lived about half as long again as the rats that were on normal diets. And as um, I get a bit of a broken record about this, but they weren't living longer in ill health. They were living longer, healthier. They did little rat post-mortems after they died. And the rats that had died you know, 50% later um, looked basically the same as the rats that had died earlier. But had been eating these much, much um, larger rations effectively. And so what we've then done, because exactly as Jenny was saying, actually, because these genes are so very well conserved across the tree of life, we've seen that this works in yeast, it works in mice, it works in dogs, it works in guppies, it works in worms. There's just this hilarious list of all the different species this has been tried in. And the only place, so, you know, you're thinking, wow, this is amazing. I'm just going to go and ditch my gluten-free fruitcake right now. 
until you realize that the closest species that's been tried into us, which is monkeys, the results, of course, are ambiguous. Um, and so, you know, we, we think it probably does exp extend healthy life, but it's not clear whether it extends lifespan overall. And there have been some experiments done in humans. Um, they, they haven't done the like full, you know, 100 year long lifespan study that I'd like to have seen. But what they can show is that you do get a little bit healthier in the short term. But of course, there are side effects. So the first thing is you feel hungry all the time. The, the people who do this for a long time report the hunger does not go away. Uh, you feel cold all the time. You can get very thin uh, bones. So some people have had to stop these trials because they noticed that their bones were getting too thin or they were getting anemic. And also, apparently, it reduces your sex drive, which I guess could be an advantage for some people. I think most of us would consider a negative side effect. So I just find it really hard to recommend cutting back your calories when there are, you know, to this significant, you know, beyond the diet sort of extent when there are just so many of these problems. And there's, there's actually a, a joke in the aging biology world that says that dietary restriction might not make you live any longer, but it'll certainly feel like longer. Brilliant. Thank you. That's not affected. That's not affected the uh, size of the slice of gluten free fruit cake I'm going to have. Uh, quick question for you, Helen, from Anita. Uh, she's just wondering if a car manufacturer donated uh, the car to the South Pole exhibition you mentioned last week. Last week, you were talking about the difference between the use of dogs, etc. And the fact that in the uh, the English uh, e expedition, we we decided to go technologically up, which was not necessarily advantageous. Uh, would, sorry, what's they the question? If they donate, did, did the car manufacturer was it a donated car that went to the South Pole? Was um, it a publicity thing in any way? I think that back in 1912, car manufacturers weren't really as well established as. The, I'm trying to remember the year that Ford came along and said you can have it any colour as long as it's black. But I think cars were very much still custom built things then. So I suspect it would have been commissioned specifically for the trip. I mean, they did take on those expeditions. You can. Um, they were always scrabbling around for money beforehand. But when you look at what they took, they always involved like a Harrods. Uh, yeah, Fort them and made some hands, hamper with you know, sort of uh, caviar and things in it. So so I, it's, it's this weird thing between you'd think the focus would be on the most energy dense, protein rich, whatever it was, you know. No, no, no. Fought them and made some hampers. So <laughs> at least some of the time, at least the special days. So, so I suspect the car was um, custom built, but I don't know. I'll have a look. We will we'll tell, we we'll we'll tell you about that. tell you about that next week. Um, now, this one I'm not entirely sure, and I'm not sure who's going to get to, to go for this. So I'm just going to. This is from Ian, and it's a question involving I Am Legend, which is one of my favourite novels Ooh. of all time by Richard Matheson. That's but nice. I think this is referring to the um, unsatisfactory adaptation by Will Smith. I might be wrong about this. Uh, Ian says, for some reason I can't quite fathom. I've been thinking about I Am Legend lately. My question is, in reality, could that sort of gene therapy be used to fight some? Something like COVID now in the movie, as far as I remember, there's a gene therapy to fight the, the nature of the vampirism. Um, I asked this because I've read a number of scientists suggest that some of the science, vampires aside, uh, that underpins that story is actually quite accurate. Jenny, do you have an opinion I, on this? I love this film. It's not, not incredible in a, in a white coat. So sexy. But they do a lot of really good science in the film. It, it's basically... Uh, Will Smith, he's trying to find a cure for the zombie rat, whatever thing that went wrong when Emma Thompson decided to do gene therapy using a measles virus. Uh, but he's, you know, he's got a lab notebook. He does animal trials on the vampire rats. And then he, if he gets a good compound, he escalates it to human trials. He captures one of the vampires, whatever they're called, and experiments on them. He keeps very meticulous notes, a video diary. I mean, it's, it's really nice. It's a really nice film. And I know it has a really crap ending. <laughs> but... Uh, Yes, vi viruses can be used as gene therapy vectors. In theory, you know, it could go horribly wrong. Uh, but really the most telling thing about the movie is that it's, it's, it's basically reinforcing the stereotype that scientists, even if they're well-meaning, always lose control of their experiments and endanger the world. And this is a very deep, ancient fear that people have about science. And I Am Legend, unfortunately, perpetuates that fear. And one day I hope to go to the movies and see more scientists being the good guys, uh, not destroying the world, but saving it. The, uh, can I just ask you, have you actually read the novel? Have you actually read the novel uh, by Richard uh, Matheson? No, by I haven't. Richard Matheson. No, why I haven't. In, that's why you enjoyed the film. Okay, that's all I want to know. I, <laughs> well, it was Will uh, Smith in the white coat. That's why I enjoyed it. Should we read is, the book, Robin? Is, is the book worth reading? It's brilliant. Richard Matheson, who was a really great uh, writer of science fiction, also wrote the story that led to The Incredible Shrinking Man and, uh, and, and great writer on The Twilight Zone. It is a fascinating book filmed, uh, filled with aphorisms. And the, as you said, the end of that film... Not merely is it bad, it means that whoever adapted it didn't even understand what the book was 
about, but I would highly recommend I Am Legend. It's, it's pretty much a novella. It's it's not long. It's maybe 140, 150 list. pages. One of my favourite um, novels of all time. Um, now, this one is, uh, again, I, I, I'll, I'll start off. I'll start with you on on this, Andrew. But this is uh, this is from uh, I'm not sure if it's Mister Four Seventy or Mister One Four Seven Zero. I apologise if either pronunciation was inaccurate. Uh, and they would like some discussion about normal forgetfulness and ageing, names, people's events, hard to recall. Uh, my mind often won't won't. Sorry, my mind won't offer me the word I need, and sometimes gives a substitute. What can we? all expect with memory and aging now this is something i find fascinating because i think it is i've i've presumed that part of this is actually the number of words that you have increases and therefore your desire to find them that, that it might be that the filing system is, is too big as opposed to the fact we can't remember we have so much more to remember but you will actually know what is this scenario it's very challenging actually i'm not a neuroscientist and i think even if you did ask a neuroscientist their answer would be a sort of longer version if we don't know exactly what's going on um because memories they're they, they're these huge networks of neurons and we just you know, literally you know millions or billions of neurons might be involved it's very very hard to disentangle what exactly is going on inside them um and not only that you know the neurons themselves there are all these supporting cells in the brain there's the you know the dna the mitochondria all the stuff that's going on inside the cells i think we really don't know exactly how memories are stored but the thing that gives me some hope that we will be able to do something to improve people's memory with aging is that a lot of the processes that happen in the cells in the brain and the uh, you know various different parts of the brain are the same as processes that happen in other parts of the body that we can show do improve the aging process. So, for example, these senescent cells, it's a really fascinating thing. The um, neurons, a lot of the neurons in your brain never divide. So you're born with the same neuron that you die with. And uh, so those neurons, they don't get telomere shrinkage. But what they do get is this damage to the telomeres because it's a very metabolically active part of your body. You know, your brain uses an awful lot of energy. And so when the telomeres get sufficiently damaged, these brain cells can enter a state that's a lot like senescence. And actually, those senolytic drugs they tried on mice, they do seem to have some effect on neurology. Now, obviously, we can't give mice a, a name test because they, they, they can't talk, they don't understand words. Um, but what you can do is you can put them in a maze. And if you put a young mouse in a maze, what you find is that it's quite curious. It wants to you know, find its way around. It zips about and tries to work out what's going on. If you put an older mouse in a cage, they're a bit more anxious. They're not really sure about things. They don't want to get involved. But if you give an older mouse some of these senolytic drugs that kill the senescent cells, then they seem to, um, they seem to rejuvenate their curiosity. So though I don't think I can give a very satisfactory answer to exactly what's going on with age-related memory loss, I think what we'll probably find is it's very similar to the kinds of processes of aging that are happening elsewhere in the body. And Hopefully that means that even if that's not you know, directly what we're intending to treat, it is something we will be able to do something about. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. The, uh, do you see what I did there? Good. Oh, that's very clever. <laughs> uh, right. The um, uh, this is we, we've almost run out of time, and I'm just going to quickly throw this one out. Uh, it, it's probably such a long answer, but I'll just see where we can get started with this, Andrew. Uh, this is from Nikki Day, who wants to know what actually causes aging, and uh, what are we able to do to mitigate the effects? I presume the quickest answer is buy your book, Ageless. Yeah, absolutely. What I should do now is uh, pull out this that I've had secreted next to me the whole time. There it is, Ageless: The New Science of Getting Older. Um, I did mention in this, I talk about these 10 hallmarks, and I really think that's the best approach we're going to take for now. Things like senescent cells, things like damage to our DNA, things like uh, reducing the function of the mitochondria, the power plants in our cells. All of these things happen together. They all underpin loads of different diseases. If we can treat all 10 of those hallmarks, I can't guarantee you that we'll all live forever, but I think we'll be you know, a lot healthier until later in life. So that's a good thing. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Richard, we haven't got quite got time for your question. For we'll, your try question. And do, we'll try and do that on, on a later show. Thank you very much, everyone, for sending questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all the questions from the live chat either. Uh, we're back next uh, Sunday and we are doing a show which is going to be predominantly about coding because people want to know more and more about coding. Uh, we've got Matt Parker and, in fact, just go and check who we've got. We've got a great lineup and Helen will be joining us again. Thank you very much to Jenny. Don't forget Cat Zero is available, the prescient novel that came out in 2018, which may well now... Uh, you might nod your head more as you read it, as you see some of your own uh, pandemic life gone. Uh, Andrew's book that we just mentioned there, Ageless, is out. Um, Helen Chersky's book is still out, still available, isn't it? Storm in a teacup. They can still get yeah, it. Yeah, it's... still trying to write the next one and getting stuck. But what, what Jenny didn't say about universities that actually we're all doing teaching. That's, what you, that's what's actually stopping research. It's nothing to do with COVID. And killing yes, our brain cells. There is another one on the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 
So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We'll be back, as I said, at 3 o'clock next week. Don't forget, you can go and catch up. Uh, all, all of our book shambles are available for free. And then we've got loads of other stuff as well for Patreon uh, supporters. If you can support us via Patreon, uh, just go to the patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. That will make uh, a huge difference because we really need to start doing that now as basically most of us are kind of out of, out of a job, creating a lot of things, but out of a job. Um, and uh, thank you very much to uh, someone else who's out of a job uh, and has been stuck at home as well with a foot injury for a while, but has been been just so much work uh, fantastic work uh, and that is Trent Burton so thank you very much to him who's produced uh, our show as usual and produces all of our other things uh, see you next week <laughs>